іншого часових поясів. Катрусь. Yes, good evening, uh, good evening to everyone, good evening to all of the participants of our seminars and uh, my greetings to our Japanese colleagues and to students. Сподіваємося, що сьогодні нам вдасться провести гарно, спокійно семінар, бо тема сьогодні засідання надзвичайно актуальна. Ми говоримо про катастрофи, і сьогодні ранок для України почався з чергового обстрілу. Тому сподіваємося, що нам вдасться працювати в спокої і в тиші. Ми сподіваємося, що ми можемо мати успішний семінар сьогодні. Наша тема сьогодні дуже важливою the current events, because we are talking about catastrophes today. And unfortunately, this morning for Ukraine also began with uh, another shelling, another missile attack. So we do hope to have a peaceful day and a successful seminar today. Yeah, I'm very yeah. sorry to hear that, yeah. Yes, we have a very dangerous day today because there is a massive attack in different regions of Ukraine, but we still enough electricity and internet, and we are in shelters, and we are ready to continue our seminars. Okay, thank, thank you for, yeah, thank you for cooperation. So uh, you are attending uh, from your uh, home, or you are uh, on the campus, student? Bring. Alexei, how? Where where are you now? At home or? Uh, hello. Yes, uh, I'm currently at home. If we were at campus, we would have to head down into our shelter, which doesn't have a good internet connection. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. So you have a shelter uh, uh, at the university. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see. I had uh, uh, you had uh, uh, the holiday of the day of uh, uh, Sobornos. I don't I don't know how to how to, what to say in English Sobornos. Uh, what what is a day? It is a day of unity for Ukraine. Unity, yeah, unity. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can say this. Uh, so basically, it is a day when the whole country comes together uh, and when we celebrate uh, the day of unity. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to add on the 22nd of January in 1919, uh, the manifesto of the unification of Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine was announced. Uh -huh. And this holiday symbolizes for us the unity of all Ukraine and for all Ukrainians. Uh, could you please uh, uh, could you please uh, repeat uh, in what in uh, what year when when in 1999 1999 Na 1990 uh, 1990 okay. mm -hmm. Thank you very much yeah. Okay so maybe uh, we could uh, we might start or uh, we are waiting for someone Maybe ah uh, yeah ah uh, ah uh, Tuko uh, are you there? Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, le uh let's uh, let's uh, start uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, as uh, uh, Saitama University uh, has uh, two presenters, so uh, let me uh, introduce uh, uh, Yushi and uh, uh, Danji. <laughs> Danji. Uh, I'm sorry, we uh, made uh, some mistakes, uh, so uh, I was theme uh, are not necessarily about uh, the art of the catastrophe, but uh, it uh, uh, has something to do with uh, our uh, main topic, tradition or philosophy or literature. Okay, so uh, please start, uh, Yushi. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, now I, uh, done, yeah. Please. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanji Furukawa, and and uh, my name is Yoshi Nakatsuka. Nice to meet you. Uh, today we are going to introduce about this topic: uh, Japanese Emperor Tenno and Yukio Mishima's perspective. Uh, about uh, abstract about Tenno of Japan. Uh, Japanese royal family is the oldest in the world and the present emperor Naruhito became the uh, 126th emperor of Japan in 20, uh, 2019. Uh, is the only emperor in the world today. Uh, the royal family live in imperial palace in Tokyo. Uh, Japanese emperor has been widely supported by Japanese people. It is said that the unbroken line of the royal family uh, from the great, uh, great son Godness continued to the present emperor, Naruhito, from some thousand years ago. However, this uh, idea is come from the mythology. In fact, it is not clear when the their first emperor was born in Japan. In historical research, uh, the, uh, the certain emperor uh, Nintoku uh, is believed to have existed in real. In our opinion, the existence of the first emperor Jimmu, who is the grandchildren of God and other mythologies, God, are more likely fiction. Uh, Japanese mythology is not the same as actual history, but it is true that the origin of Japanese royal family is considered to come from the mythology. Japanese emperor who do religious studies must pray happiness of people and peace of nation. Japanese emperor have been regarded as the existence of public. For example, uh, Emperor Showa asked the close advisor, it continued to rain. How is rice plant? And uh, just before death, the quality of rice plant in people's life. He was worried about quality of rice plant growing up by farmers in the year than his plan a pain of ironies. This episode means even before his death, Emperor Shuwa was a public man. A lot of European king and Chinese emperor in history were willing to kill and sacrifice their people for one benefit and wealth. Eventually, those king and emperors tend to collapse their political system, then a new king or emperor appears and rule people again. The history of China, Japan neighborhood countries repeat this process again and again. Of course, in Japanese history, the rules and the political system changed in many times. But no one abolished the system of the emperor. Uh, why has the system of the emperor escaped abolition by the power that we at time? Our question, this is our question. Uh, since the 30th centuries, uh, the emperors had not been involved in political because of the rise of samurai group. Uh, Shogun is the leader of all samurai group. The Shogun with the greatest military power at time become the real ruler of the world. By recognizing that Shogun, the emperor justified his rule of Japan. And then the emperor didn't have any choice. So that the emperors at time were not political threat. Uh, after 30 centuries, uh, emperors uh, only, only conduct 
a religious festival for happiness and peace and study the Japanese traditional culture, art, and classic literature. And the relationship between the emperor and academic studies has long history. And the retired emperor Akihito has been admitted in various countries for his achievement in the field of histology. The, the current emperor Naruhito is master in transportation history. Tenno as modern emperor. Uh, from the late of 19th centuries, Japan need to become, uh, become a modern countries to avoid invasion by Europe countries. Japan people import, import, imported legal system, academic, political system, culture, military, literature uh, from European countries such as ja uh, German, England, England, France, and the United States. To make Japan a nation state, the constitution of the Emperor of Japan in uh, 18, 1886, uh, 1889, regarded Japanese Tenno as the Emperor like modern Europe. For example, Emperor's Meiji uniform was changed the Japanese kimono to the military uniform. The picture of Emperor Meiji was in inspired by modern Western emperors. From the right of 19th century, uh, the image of emperor changed from the symbol of culture to the military leader of Japan. However, such as British royal family, Japanese emperor didn't have any political right and power. He could only approve the decision of the government at time. From the uh, Manchurian incident in 1931, Japanese army abused the emperor's authority to justify military action and invasion of Manchuria and China. Eventually, Japan had to admit the defeat of World War II in 1945. After WW2, uh, the emperors beca became the symbol of Japan under the new Japan constitution, which the occupation forced of the United Nations rate and uh, create. Uh, there is no agreement of whether Emperor Showa was responsible for the war. However, even after suffering a serious defeat of WW2, Emperor Showa was not killed and many Japanese people have con uh, continued to re uh, respect the emperors so that the emperor system remains now. Uh, Yukio Mishima, Aspect of a Japanese Emperor. There are many op opinions and ideas about the Japanese Emperor. This time, our group focuses on the Emperor's influence of Japanese culture. Yukio Mishima has a unique idea about the relationship between the uh, Emperors and culture. Therefore, I would like to introduce Mishima build of the Emperor. Uh, abstract of writer Yukio Mishima. Uh, Yukio Mishima is a highly popular novelist of Japan and a nationalist. Yasunari Kawabata, who Professor Susumu Nonaka introduced his literature on the other day, is Mishima's teacher and libel. Mishima's work have been translated in many other languages, contain Ukrainian languages, got worldwide known as a Japanese writer. His famous work is Kinkakuji, the Temple of the Golden Pavilion, modeled actual incident. This work is known as one of the great works of Japan, modern Japanese literature. I like Kinkakuji very much, so I would like to recommend to you. From around 1960, he started being interested in political subject, little by little. He published some political novel and essay. He found private political students' organization against new left groups in 1968. 
Mishima wanted to be the pioneer of the National Guard. He believed that the communist revolution would not have a good effect on Japan. If a communist revolution broke out, he wanted to his private organization to cooperate with the army and the police to kill the revolution. Communism revolution tend to deny the traditional culture such as Soviet Union and China. Uh, Mishima was extremely afraid of losing Japanese traditional culture and the spirit. In 1970, he barricaded with the military base of Ichigaya and urged soldiers to take an action for the revision of Japanese constitution. However, soldiers and officers didn't welcome to hear. Eventually, he did suicide with Masakatsu Morita by Japanese soul, aged 45. Mishima's view uh, to the emperor from his literature. Uh, Mishima says that Japanese emperor is different from the president. It differs on the point of passing down from father to son. The emperor differs from usually monarchs in one respect of religious services for Japanese people. The emperor is a symbol of Japanese historical continuity and a symbol of worshiping Japanese ancestors. The emperor as a cultural concept. Mishima argues that in the history of Japan, there were only a few emperors who were genius as politicians or military leaders. But uh, there have been a lot of emperors who were genius as scholars, writers, and artists at times. In his book, The Defense of the Culture in 1967, Mishima argued that the unchanging essence of Japanese culture is the uh, emperor as the old cultural concept. Political systems and social environment have changed dramatically through the history of Japan. Uh, Japanese culture has changed since ancient times. At the same time, we can say that the culture has continued. Uh, Mishima thought that the on, uh, only the axis of the emperor has remained unchanged in the culture of his, culture's history. So he focused on Japanese emperor as the oldest cultural concept. Of course, uh, the culture needs the uncontrolled person to create every at times. So the culture needs totality, which allows all cultures expressions such as liberal democracy. Uh, if the expression's meaning didn't fit the current political thinking or social morality, the freedom of expressions were necessary for developing the culture. So that Mishima thought that the emperor has maintained this cultural concept of totality to allow its expressions. In the defense of the culture, each emperor until now has had the capacity to admitting the culture of freedom. Uh, that is the uh, nature of the old cultural concept of Japanese emperor. Mishima rejected the dictators and the communist country uh, like China and uh, recognized the liberal democracy in Japan because he thought the freedom of expressions were necessary for developing Japanese culture. Japanese emperor and culture. Mishima thought the emperor is the unchanging axis of Japanese history and the birth of Japanese culture's identity. So that if every Japanese people would share the old cultural concept of Japanese emperor, uh, we would get the sense of the being the same nation and overcome the mental decline of mind and moral in Japan little by little. Uh, these are the ideas of Yukio Mishima, and I think that uh, he was extremely afraid of losing the Japanese traditional culture spirit a uh, little by little in the 20th century. Uh, after World War II, many Japanese people have thought the American culture academic trend is better than Japanese culture. Uh, he worried about uh, losing something important. Uh, or 
uh, we may already lose those important Japanese cultural spirit. This is the outcome. Um, our group thinks uh, Mishima's awareness of the cultural problem can sue all the modern least developed countries, uh, which contained Japan, Russia, China, Korea, and the Ukraine. Uh, the developing country will have to think this identity and the traditional culture's problem in the future. Uh, there is a problem of the national identity and the westernization or globalization. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Do you have any opinion or question? Uh, I want to welcome to hear. Okay. Thank you, Nancy, uh, and uh, you should, yeah. Okay, so uh, if you have any questions uh, or comments, please uh, feel free to talk. Ah, uh, Christina, uh, please. Um, okay, uh, as far as I know, the emperor is the son of the sun, um, the goddess of uh, a goddess Amaterasu, yes. And uh, do you have any legend of uh, this origin, or is it just a cultural concept? Christina, uh, we have a little bit of. Uh, 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 technical problem. Uh, do, uh, could you... Okay, uh, I repeat. As far as I know, uh, the emperor is uh, uh, a son of the sun, mm, uh, the goddess of uh, um, goddess Amaterasu. So, do you have any legends of this origin, or it is just a, a cultural concept? Yeah, I will answer. The, uh, I say the, uh, the goddess of the sun uh, were the origin of Japanese emperor, uh, but that is the um, mythology's idea, the our emperor's history. So that uh, mm, the the goddess of the sun means um, like the. Uh, the uh, old Greece uh, mythologies like the were <laughs> there's a problem. So could you ask me the your question more easy to understand? Please use your word to easily understand. Could you ask me? Uh, okay. So um, does it uh, it means that uh, um, the goddess literary. Uh, born um, the first emperor, or it's just an idea that uh, um, the emperor is the continuation of uh, um, God. And there is a uh, when those kind of idea was made, or who made? Is that your question? Mm, yes. No, uh, I think that uh, in the Japanese historical research, the the book of Kojiki and the Japanese book of the Nihon Shoki uh, were written about the mythology of gods. That book was written in the about the four hundred or five hundred uh, years, uh, so that. Uh, Many Japanese historical research people regarded those kind of Japanese mythologies book as uh, justify the Japanese government at the uh, four century or five century. Uh, so that many Japanese people uh, from now uh, don't regard the, those kind of the mythologies book as actual history. Mm, that is my opinion. Okay. Thanks for. Thanks. Yeah, uh, very a uh, little bit di difficult uh, question and answer. Yeah. Uh, you, hey, do you have any uh, comment? Yes, my name is Yuhei Nakaigawa. Uh, thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, I have a comment and questions. Uh, I didn't know 
how meaning of hen or changed precisely. So it was new new information for me. It was interesting. And I have one question. Uh, do you think Mishima's idea is suitable for today's society? Sorry, uh, Rust, Rust, uh, Rust, do you, uh, you want to say the priest? I don't, I can't listen here. Okay. Uh, do you think Mishima's idea is suit, suits for today's Japanese society? Suits good. In the Japanese. Ah, uh, um, in in just my opinion, uh, Mishima, it, uh, Mishima ideas, uh, Spria, Mishima, uh, idea will be Spria, uh, 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 Spria, um, uh, what? What's in the Japanese culture and uh, you, um, beautiful idea for uh, uh, Japanese culture? Uh, I, I, uh, I, I would say uh, Mishima idea as uh, by Konsepto uh, of Right, Mishima, uh, the beautiful, the beautiful, uh, uh, the, the people have beautiful and uh, uh, um, beautiful uh, from from the, from the literature works as like a king of Okay, I want to answer your question. That's a very good question. The, does the Mishima thinking or literature influence our culture or society? And my answer is that is a uh, collect, one of the collect. Uh, Mishima was dead in 1969. In that time, uh, we have been very busy to uh, accomplish or develop the economics or the wealth. So as many people uh, don't uh, uh, realize the problem of the culture, Japanese culture's problem. Many people don't regard it uh, in the time of the death of the Mishima. Uh, many Japanese people regarded Mishima as a good uh, writer of literature, but uh, they regard as uh, the crazy nationalist. But I think that is uh, one of collect, but one of not collect. Mm. After 20 and uh, after 20 in 20th century, uh, we have the problem of uh, national identity. Uh, our life is the same as uh, almost a European or United States lifestyle. We don't wear Japanese traditional culture and we don't feel Japanese traditional customs in our life. So we must think about the national identity. So I introduced you the Mishima's opinion of Japanese emperor. Is that okay? Uh, uh, you should thank you very much. Uh, 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 some uh, other students have questions, but uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we are uh, we don't have enough time. So maybe uh, let's uh, discuss it further the next week. Okay? Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, Olga Nikolaevna, uh, could you please introduce your presenter from Poltava? Yes, thank you. I would like to introduce undergraduate students from PNPU. Uh, Anna Murai, Darina Havranyuk, and Anastasia Batunina. Uh, their theme deals with the reflection of the Second World War in modern literature. Please. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Darina Havranyuk. I'm the fourth year student of the Faculty of Philology and Journalism. And today we would like to present you our report on the topic, the theme of the Second World War in the modern literature. 
At the beginning of the 21st century, the world came face to face with the horrible and armed aggression against Ukraine. There are no logical explanations for the horrible events and crimes experienced by Ukrainians. This cannot be forgotten, but it must be understood in order for us to survive and protect our freedom and independence. Modern writers often refer to the topic of the Second World War. Their works about the war do not contain fantasy or fun adventures, but they are worth reading in order to understand the value of human life and the means of the opposing violence. The stories about the Second World War make us realize that war can be overcome not only physically with weapons, but also spiritually if we save and preserve our culture and the people around us. On the 10th of May, Germany annually celebrates Book Day. This day reminds us of the horrors of the fascism. It was on the 10th of May, 1933, when the inhuman book burning took place in Berlin and some other German cities. On the 20th of March, 1995, the memorial at the Drowned Library was presented to the public. In the center of the square, under the thick glass, there are white room with empty shelves. The words but Henrik Heine inscribed uh, on the memorial board. Where books are burnt, people will be burnt. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Murai. I am the first year student of Poltava National Pedagogical University, and I will continue the presentation about the work by John Boyne, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Uh, John Boyne is an Irish writer, winner of numerous literary awards who touches the topic of the Holocaust. War is always terrible, especially when children suffer. John Boyne's novel, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, is one of the most heartbreaking representations of the Second World War. This work is unique in illustrating the conflict from the point of view of children. Bruno, a nine-year-old German boy, lives happily in a beautiful five-story house in Berlin with his father, mother, and sister. However, his father's job requires him to move to a new location known as Auschwitz. One of, the, uh, one of the largest Nazi concentration camps, Auschwitz-Birkenau, was located in the city of Auschwitz, Poland, where more than 1.1 million people were tortured during the Second World War. Nine-year-old Bruno, the son of the concentration camp commandant, was unaware of the tragedy that was happening nearby. With a bright and curious mind, the boy who dreamed of being an explorer became interested in a place where people wear the same striped pajamas. Bruno quickly found his way to the camp. Near the fence, he met a fellow Jewish boy named Shmuel, with whom he became friends. Little Bruno did not understand why people in the camp were wearing striped pajamas, who Jews are and what they do there. When Bruno learned that Shmuel could not find his father, he climbed over the camp fence, put on the striped pajamas brought by a friend, and disappeared forever. In his works, John Boynes addresses some of the most painful issues of the 20th century, Nazism, equality, and human rights. John Boyne writes simply, showing the history of the 20th century through the eyes of children. There are no long descriptions, also remarks, or complicated terminology in this book. It is important to note that the language of the novel is not dramatic and there are no scenes of violence in the book. The author avoids them, but the reader is aware of the existence and understands the injustice and tragedy of these events. The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, which tells the story of the Holocaust, is very relevant today, particularly in the context of the new escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in Gaza Strip and the attack on Israel. Today, Jews around the world are once again in danger. Nothing like this can happen again, not in our time, wrote John Wayne. Good afternoon, dear listeners. My name is Batonin Anastasia, and I will tell you about the French writer Eric Emmanuel Schmidt, who also addressed the topic of the Second World War. Eric Emmanuel Schmidt is a prominent writer and dramatist a doctor of philosophy and the creative of several plays and performances that are now being staged in theatres around the world. Noah's Child is a narrative, consists of the numerous elements. This is a puzzle story. Everything is there. The terrible battle, the national sense of oppression, <clears throat> the formation of a religious worldview and simple human actions. The Jewish child Joseph tells the story in the first-person perspective. Little Joseph found himself in the middle of a violent and devastating time. 
on the eve of a huge flood. This was <clears throat> only possible since he was born in a Jewish family. Plaza Pons is an important figure in this novel, a priest who put his own life in danger by sheltering Jewish children in an orphanage. Plaza Pons is an example of a priest who has never pushed his beliefs on religious on others. On the contrary, he attempted to develop in Jewish children a love for their parents' faith. According to Schmidt's perspective, the figure of Father Pons is the personification of an ideal priest. The father kept a churl scroll under the precious embroidered fabrics and a picture of Jerusalem showed where to turn during the prayer. Father's collection included prayer books, mystical poetry, and prebenic commentaries from the 7th and 9th centuries. According to Father Pons, Noah was the first collector in history. He found the male and female of every living creature to preserve and rescue from the flood of his massive ship. God created humans with the instinct and intellect to save themselves. As a result, Noah acted as a model for his father. Six million Jews were murdered during that time. The father convinced Joseph to speak about the Jews who were no longer alive. To take care about the Jews, now there is Joseph, who will be known as Noah from now on. Schmidt characters are real and honest people who represent a specific place in their life while yet feeling extremely close to the reader, as if they are great friends. The heroes have doubts, but they listen to the voice of their inner world and heart. Godness always triumphs because it's deep, diverse, and genuine. The modern literary process cannot be imagined without Australian writer Marcus Zuzak. Marcus Zuzak was born in 1971 in Sydney, Australia, as the youngest of four children of Austrian and German immigrants. His novel, Book Thief, is a tale of an orphan, Liesel Memminger, who finds companionship and a new family in a tiny village in Germany during the Second World War. Zuzak picks the topic in part to relate uh, the experiences his, pa his parents told him about growing up in, during the war in Austria and Germany. Language, reading, and writing are presented as metaphorical components of the expression of freedom throughout the story. They provide those characters who have or achieve the power of literacy, individuality, and personal liberation. Books are nearly like characters in the narrative. Each of the novel is linked to a tale of a girl's life. Hazel's adventure begins with the grave digger's handbook. She grabbed it from the snow near her brother's grave, uh, which marked the first gloomy point in the novel. The shoulder shrug Liesel rescued from the ashes of a famous celebration of Hitler's birthday. This novel is about the Jewish man who is depicted positively, which is why it was condemned. In the bomb shelter, Liesel reads the Whistler. It represents her complicated connection with Frau Hermann as well as a significant point in her personal development. The book Mein Kampf is a hate-filled idea of Hitler and his supporters, despite the fears Liesel's family conceal Max in their basement, where he can record his own struggles and experiences on the pages of Hitler's writings. The book Sif is the title of, of the book Liesel writes for months leading up to the Himmel Street explosion. It is the book that death retrieves from the ashes and gives it to Liesel after she dies. I have hated the words and I have loved them and I hope I have made them right. Books are more than simply an occupation for the girl. They're her salvation and her heart. This novel shows us the frightening example of war, violence, and Nazism. Here we can see how little Lizzie goes through her horrible reality. If only it happens in books and books only. But nowadays, Ukrainians have to face the same problems. The terrorist state has been trying to deprive our culture, our freedom of speech, and our lives. They destroy our museums and steal our cultural heritage. They burn books written by Ukrainian authors. Our children have to spend their childhood in the bomb shelters because Russia shall Ukrainian territory. For us, the book thief is more than just a novel. I think it is the portrait of our reality. The Ukrainian writer Lina Kostenko is one of the most prominent figures in our country nowadays. She saw the Second World War and wrote poems about it, but now, she writes poems about the war that began on 24th century or on 24 February 2022 in Ukraine. Her poems are spiritual support for all Ukrainians who are fighting for the right to live and walk freely on their land. Now you can see the poems of Lina Kostenko and we want to read them to you, but in, approx in approximate translation. People didn't really think about honor 
they just wanted bread and wonders. Once there was the Madonna of the crossroads, now we have the Madonna of the bomb shelters. Disaster creeps up in inedible steps, but suddenly the moment stops. The village will turn black with the burnt rafters, and the war will break out in the white world. The town is choked with blood and smoke. The empire bends its predatory spine, spade tents crawl along the road. A swastika is hiding in the letter Z, and the house are glowing in the winter veil. No one knows what they will be born with. Only over Kiev, the eyes of Saint Sophia burn the newest hold forever. It was a threatening and dark night, and I wanted silence and warmth so badly. And the explosion was a, like a yellow chrysanthemum that suddenly bloomed halfway across the sky. It shook the walls and continued for a long time. The sirens howled and the glass flashed. So what should we do? Run away? Run to the bomb shelter? The Führer would not wait in the Kremlin. Let him be afraid. He is already yesterday's man. If they saw bombs, they will reap hatred. The sirens will howl, but I'm not afraid. Those who did not run away will not be caught. Lena Kostanko said, whoever stands for anything, we stand for independence. That's why it's so hard for us. We absolutely agree with this writer. It is hard for us, but we will stand it because we do not want to be slaves to the empire. Ukraine will definitely be a free and peaceful country. This is the biggest Ukrainian dream. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, 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 Anna, uh, Darina, and Anastasia. Uh, so please uh, uh, speak, talk, uh, uh, who have uh, questions or comments. Uh, Julia? Hey, yes, thank you guys for such an interesting presentation about our topical theme. And my question will be like, uh, how do you think that uh, all this experience of wars, including World War II, shaped the literary landscape in Ukraine? Like some symbols, some motives that are current um, because of the experience of the wars. Uh, I can answer this question. Thank you for your question. Uh, this issue is extremely important for us. Uh, because we are going through the same difficult times as during the Second World War. In addition, our great-grandparents took a part in this war, and uh, this presentation is a manifestation of respect and memory for all the dead. For example, uh, my, great, my great grandfather took a part in this war. So we, again, <laughs> take a part in the same war. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna. So, Rin, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for such a great uh, presentation. I know, like, uh, all authors have their own characteristic, but if you could only, like, recommend one, like, one book, uh, what also would you, like, recommend? Sorry, can you repeat your question, please? Okay, uh, you guys like introduced like um, like some of the like authors like comment. Mm -hmm. So like I know all authors have their own like uh, experiences, so that it's kind of like they have their own characteristic. But my question is, if you could only like recommend, when like one author, like which. Like who, like, uh, what author would you like to recommend? I can answer this question. Thank you for your question. Uh, as we already said uh, about war, uh, Lina Kostenko writes some poems. Also, uh, for me, I can recommend a book uh, that called War uh, 2022 uh, because this book uh, includes uh, uh, many works of um, modern Ukrainian writers uh, like diaries, essays, and poetry. Uh, also, there you can learn uh, <clears throat> about the observation and emotions of uh, 42 authors who saw the war with their own eyes. 
Thank you so much. So, Yushi, go ahead. Yep, I have a question. Uh, the Lucia attacked the Ukrainians, it's really illegal in the international law, I understand. But the Lucia uh, justified attacking Ukrainian invasion as there is a Nazi group in Ukraine. Uh, I don't understand why the Lucia says such a thing. Um, why does the Lucia uh, say the reason there is a Nazi Ukraine? This is my question. Well, I can try to answer this. Uh, of course, I can't. Uh, I can be sure why they are doing this, but um, mostly um, they try. To, I guess they try to justify their actions uh, in a different ways because uh, they uh, commit a lot of horrors, and we experience just horrible things every day. Uh, like just this morning, a lot of Ukrainian cities. Um, suffered from their shelling, and uh, I guess um, that's uh, just a way of uh, again to justify the actions, uh, even uh, when there is no uh, evidence for that. Thanks for answering my question. Thanks. Yeah, let, let me say, uh, of course, uh, what uh, Russian uh, uh, authority says is uh, totally uh, de de demagogy, demagogue. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure about that. Okay, so uh, uh, someone, uh, do you have any comments or one more? So I have a question uh, uh, to you. Uh, so do you think uh, uh, more and more Ukrainians uh, read uh, uh, literature about uh, World War II uh, uh, after this war has begun? Uh, do, do you think so? Or is there some uh, evidence or uh, many, uh, uh, many uh, mm, essays about uh, those literature, literary works? Or translations, Ukrainian translate more and more translations uh, about those themes, World War Two. Yeah, I think I can answer this question. Thank you. Uh, I can say that uh, in Ukraine we have so many authors that uh, wrote about uh, about the Second World War and wrote about this war. Uh, if you're interested in the past uh, past writers. Uh, we can say about Alexander Dovzhenko and uh, Oleg Gonchar. Uh, there are two writers that uh, we learned in our in schools. Uh, uh, and uh, for example, uh, Alexander Dovzhenko has the uh, work Ukraine on Fire. Uh, so for uh, nowadays, um, we have a lot of writers, for example, Sergei Zhadan, Sofia Andropovich, Pavel Veshebaba, Yuri Andropovich, and the others. So, if you don't mind, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, we should introduce the, the third presenter uh, from Lviv, uh, uh, Lydia Tensei. Так, дякую, шановний професор Сусумусан. Ми починаємо нашу презентацію. Будь ласка, Катю і Владислав. Yeah. Um, good morning to my colleagues in Lviv and Poltava. It's a good time of the uh, day to our Japanese colleagues. So our presentation is about Chernobyl disaster and how it was uh, perceived in postmodernism and in by postmodernist artists. And I would like to start with telling you what it was and what exactly happened. Uh, so the disaster took place on April 26th. Could you please next slide? Uh, yes. Uh, so the disaster happened in uh, Chernobyl uh, at the Chernobyl power complex. It uh, was uh, it consisted of four reactors 
and one of them uh, had a passive void coefficient, uh, which contributed to the accident. And in 1986, on April 26 in the morning, um, a flowed reactor, uh, and also it was uh, worsened by inadequate opera training, uh, shut down mechanism, and it caused a power surge which led to a series of explosions and a steam explosion and fires released over 5% of the radioactive reactor core into the environment, which led to widespread deposition of radioactive materials in Europe. Sorry, technical uh, problems. Can you see the slide yeah. switch? Uh, yeah, I'm just switching slides, but I think you can see them, right? One second. How about now? Okay, yes, now you can see the before and after, how it looked before and what happened after. It resulted in the largest uncontrolled release of radioactive materials that were ever recorded in civilian operations. And it lasted about 10 days. As the event had severe social and economic consequences for populations in Ukraine, mainly in Ukraine, but also in the whole USSR at the time. And most of the released materials were actually settled nearby, but a lighter particle they crossed uh, the whole U uh, Ukraine and they went uh, uh, on to spread throughout Belarus, Russia, Scandinavia, and parts of Europe. After the Chernobyl accident, uh, the priority was to actually uh, clean up and uh, restart maybe the remaining three reactors. Uh, around 200 individuals, uh, now known as liquidators, were actually uh, engaged in um, uh, seizing the fire. It uh, later increased to over 600 people. And uh, after this accident, people settled around 220 of people, they had to resettle into less contaminated areas uh, and the initial 30 kilometer radius exclusion zone, it was expanded to cover 4,300 uh, 4, square, square kilometers. Uh, the resettlement criteria were based on a projected lifetime radiation uh, ever imagined and uh, actual radiation cells actually quickly fell, but Still, uh, people could not get back to their previous life and they left everything as it was. Uh, Soviet authorities, they actually initially concealed all the information mm -hmm. and they did not uh, tell the public about it. Only in a, um, after 36 hours have passed and other countries saw the radiation go up in their, uh, in their countries, uh, they announced that. Please, next slide. Yeah, so as we can see, uh, the aftermath of the disaster involved cleanup uh, efforts uh, by liquidators. It uh, was also measured that uh, uh, they suffered health waste, they suffered a uh, huge, uh, huge amount of radiation crossing their bodies. Yes, um, you can take a picture, you can take a look at picture, it was left, the place that the radiators, uh, I mean liquidators left. Yes, and despite the ongoing impact uh, of Chernobyl tragedy, efforts have been made to actually mitigate the, uh, the consequences and recent events that uh, we know after full-scale invasion, uh, Russia's forces, they crossed Chernobyl, they actually took place there and they uh, occupied the plant. However, counter-offensive in March 2022 um, led to uh, uh, like uh, Ukraine overtaking power uh, by plant, but still Russia's forces, Russian aggression is a constant threat to humanity as they uh, destroyed laboratories, they uh, constantly try to sabotage the world, they try to um, threaten uh, the world with their nuclear forces and uh, also with nuclear power plants as their weapon. So we have to be careful of that now. They still occupy the Parisia uh, nuclear power plant and it is still constant threat to the world safety. Hello everyone, I'm going to continue this presentation. My name is Kate Shvorov and the Chernobyl accident played a role in the downfall of the Soviet Union by amplifying 
public distrust, environment authorities, and it also underscored that the Soviet culture of secrecy was not only backward, but also potentially disastrous. Additionally, the substantial economic burden of addressing the accidents of the month further weakened the Soviet region. Due to Chernobyl, some governments opted to discontinue existing nuclear energy programs, while others abandoned plans for new ones, and this decision was made even though the Chernobyl incident involved a distinctive reactor design and a comparable accident was deemed physically implausible with light water reactors. After the Chernobyl disaster, um, the United States, along with other nations and international organizations, assisted in constructing a protective concrete shelter known as a sarcophagus to contain the damaged reactor and prevent further contamination. To address safety concerns, the U.S. and its partners provided aid, including equipment and training for nuclear reactor operators and regulators to enhance the safety of these facilities and ensure preparedness for potential emergencies. Some members of the International Atomic Energy Agency advocated for an increased role in nuclear safety, uh, leading to the development and adoption of the Convention on Nuclear Safety. It's a treaty aimed at uh, promoting global nuclear power reactor safety. Administered by the IAEA, the convention was recognized in 2010 as contributing to improved uh, global nuclear safety based on feedback from participating countries. Uh, Pripyat, uh, initially built for nuclear workers, it's a town near, actually in Chernobyl zone, in Chernobyl region. Uh, it was initially built for nuclear workers and their families housed around 50,000 people who had to evacuate rapidly after the explosion of reactor number four and the evacuation completed within hours was delayed in informing citizens of the explosion's severity and some residents including firefighters perished uh, trying to control uh, the radioactive fire while others suffered radiation effects leading to illnesses such as thyroid cancer since the explosion Pritchett has remained uninhabitable with deteriorating buildings reflecting the aftermath. A few individuals have returned, but it's rare and recently opened to tourists. The town has seen wildlife thrive in the absence of human inhabitants over the past four decades. Also, it's very important to um, mention the Fukushima incident that intensified the unfavorable view of nuclear energy, leading to more uh, decisions uh, against nuclear programs. It's important to know that the Fukushima reactor situation was unique and they do not represent modern reactor designs. Contrarily, the uh, Three Mile Island accident highlighted that a well-designed containment building can effectively safeguard public health and safety even the event of a severe accident. After 25 years after Chernobyl, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident in Japan prompted a global reassessment by safety regulators and they considered enhancements such as mandating backup generators as seen in Fukushima and preparing for unforeseen accident scenarios. Like Chernobyl, Fukushima emphasized the vital role of safety culture, acknowledging that while new nuclear technologies may be inherently safer, human involvement remains crucial for nuclear safety. And we would like to talk about how artists perceived the Chernobyl disaster and how it was represented in, the, in art of the time. Uh, Postmodernist artists they, uh, responded uh, not as a uh, whole thing, but still on, on one moment. Yeah, I'm very sorry for the noise. So they responded very individually. Everyone explored it in uh, various topics, in various concern, expressed various concerns, but overall they delved into environmental concerns, how it would impact the uh, future of humanity, how it would uh, like added human activities, and they should raise awareness. They believe they should raise awareness about nuclear risks uh, via their art and. Um, make people uh, aware of the ecosystem fragility in the wake of the significant environmental catastrophe that uh, the Chernobyl disaster actually was. 
narratives of trauma and historical events typical in postmodernist art, they became a focal point for artists inspired by the immediate and long-term consequences of the disaster. They sought to understand and to portray the uh, repercussions of human actions on communities and in environment. Uh, critical engagement with technology was another avenue through which uh, artists expressed their response to the disaster. Stemming from technological failure, the disaster prompted reflections on the ethical dimensions of scientific advances, of war advances, and the potential risks associated with unchecked technological progress. Yeah, the inclination to question traditional power structures was found in reflections on the disaster, and it was linked mainly to Soviet Union's management and suppression of information. Uh, the event became a symbol for artists to contemplate the consequences of authoritarian regimes and the manipulation of truths that uh, USSR management, uh, political power, tried to impose. Embracing interdisciplinary approaches, but modernist artists integrated various media and technologies to capture the complex nature of the disaster, and they experimented with different forms. They combined visual arts, literature, and music, and performance overall, allowing them to fully express the uh, sorrow that they felt and the concerns that they felt due to the disaster. Mm, uh, the art saw the Chernobyl as um, as a place where something great and awful at the same time happened and uh, they sought to find ways to uh, both uh, uh, raise the concern in the world and to stop something uh, of the same awful strength to happen again worldwide it, although it was not a singular response but worldwide artists engaged with the, the themes of chernobyl disaster expressing it in different genres and um uh, explaining how it could lead to the awful global picture in, on our planet. We shall further explore the uh, pieces of literature and uh, cinematography that actually showcase the event itself and its uh, aftermath. I'll start with Midnight in Chernobyl by Adam Higginbar. This is one of the greatest uh, books. It is, uh, it is written by British journalist and he explores uh, history of uh, this event, how it happened. Um, his book is based on previously unpublished and classified facts about the disaster, as well as the memories and interviews of witnesses at the time. He explores the global consequences of Chernobyl disaster, encompassing its environmental ramifications and geopolitical aftermath. Also, the another book, uh, Chernobyl uh, 01-2340, which is the exact time where the uh, explosion happened, the first explosion happened, and it is written also by fellow British author Andrew Letterborough, and uh, he is a specialist in the history of nuclear energy, so it is only logical that he explores the topic of Chernobyl. He deconstructed the events that happened. He uh, spent uh, several months on expeditions and explored uh, prepared to uh, discover what exactly happened. He also goes into true path, so it is also based on uh, the actual event. And um, he reflects generally on how uh, everything happened and how it could be uh, now a lesson to us all. And one more book, uh, which is also, not also, which is like written by a Ukrainian author, Chernobyl, the History of the Nuclear Disaster by Sergei Plohi. Uh, it um, provides a nuanced and detailed exploration of the events uh, leading, uh, up to, uh, leading up to and following the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Plohi well, begins by examining the Soviet Union's political climate mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, decision um, making processes that led to the construction of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. He delves into the technical flaws in the RBMK reactor design, emphasizing how these design flaws played a crucial role in the dis disaster. And uh, Plohi also uh, combines technical explanations with personal stories. Uh, of the individual involved, including the plant workers, firefighters, and local residents, 
Uh, the writer also uh, examines the immediate response to the disaster, uh, including uh, the evacuation of the nearby town of Pripyat and the initial attempts to contain the radioactive release. The book uh, goes on to explore the broader consequences of Chernobyl on global perceptions of nuclear energy, the environmental impact and the geopolitical repercussions during the final years of the Cold War. And uh, one more thing that we are going to share with you is postmodernist cinematographic view on the catastrophe. And uh, uh, Chernobyl, uh, this television miniseries that premiered in 2018, I think these are the most popular ones um, on the topic of Chernobyl. And uh, this is a historical drama created by Craig Messen and uh, Johan Rank. And that series consists of five episodes and in the co production between HBO and Sky UK, it received widespread critical acclaim for its accurate portrayal of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in 1986 and its aftermath. And uh, the series begins with the explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Pripyat and following the immediate aftermath of the disaster. It focuses on the efforts uh, to contain the radioactive fallout and the impact on the local population and the investigation that followed. And the narrative unfolds uh, through the perspectives of key figures involved, including Valeria Legasso, a Soviet nuclear physicist, Boris Sherbina, a Soviet government official, and Ulyana Fomyuk, a Belarusian nuclear physicist. Uh, and the series also delves into the systemic flaws uh, of the Soviet Union's nuclear industry, the suppression of information, and the theories of individuals who risk their lives to prevent further catastrophe. And uh, a film, which is uh, on the right, Land of Oblivion, is a French language drama. Uh, and this film was released in 2011. It is not a documentary, but a narrative feature that deals with the aftermath of the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, this uh, film is set in Pripyat during, uh, during and after the catastrophic events. Uh, and the story follows the lives of two young lovers uh, as they navigate the immediate consequences of the nuclear disaster and its long-term impact on their lives. This film explores themes of love, loss, and resilience, and uh, it depicts the physical and emotional devastation caused by the Chernobyl incident, and it also provides a personal and intimate perspective on, on the lives of those affected, offering a human portrayal of the disaster's aftermath. This film takes a dramatic approach to storytelling rather than being a documentary, and it uses the Chernobyl disaster as a backdrop to explore human experiences during and after the event. Although various consequences of Chernobyl catastrophe can be vividly seen, let's not forget about the ongoing Russia's aggression against Ukraine. In February 2022, during the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Russian forces reportedly moved vehicles through the Red Forest, using it as a route for their convoys, which kicked up clouds of radioactive dust from the forest. Uh, the name Red Forest, uh, it's, uh, you can see it here on the slide, uh, it comes from the ginger brown color of the pine trees after they died following the absorption of high levels of ionizing radiation because of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. The site remains one of the most contaminated areas in the world today. Uh, still, uh, local workers reported the Russian uh, troops moving through the Red Forest were not using protective suits and could have potentially endangered themselves. And uh, it was reported that most of the Russian troops occupying Chernobyl were forced to pull back after suffering from radiation sickness caused by digging trenches in the heavily contaminated Red Forest. Ukrainian officials have provided access to the site, which shows considerable trenches and um, uh, yeah, and uh, which provided access to the site, which shows considerable trenches and digging in the Red Forest. And um, the Daily Te Telegraph reported that one Russian soldier died from acute radiation sickness after being camped in the Red Forest for a prolonged time. And in October uh, 2022, CNN reported that injured Russian soldiers who operated in Chernobyl had been um, treated at the Republican Research Center for Radiation Medicine and Human Ecology in Belarus, including some who showed signs of radiation poisoning. The only lesson can be learned from that, uh, that it would have been better if Russian soldiers hadn't tried their luck and stayed at home instead of attacking the north of Ukraine without realizing the outcomes.
thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Yeah, thank you very much, Vlad and uh, Kate, Katya. Yeah? Uh, so uh, please uh, uh, give them questions or comments. Uh, Yulia, uh, Yulia Petrova, please. I thank you for such a great and detailed presentation. The Chernobyl disaster is a huge tragedy that changed a lot of people's lives. Um, but before the Russian invasion in Ukraine, there were many tourists to Chernobyl zone. So my question is, would you like to visit a Chernobyl zone or maybe you have already visited it? Thank you. Um. I can start answering. Vlada continues. Thank you for your question. Uh, actually, it is my dream <laughs> to visit uh, Chernobyl zone. We have um, excursions, uh, which is uh, really legally to visit uh, this um, zone. Yeah, um, I know that it's quite dangerous, but still, uh, we would not visit, I think, that forest. Uh, but uh, yeah, it would be very interesting to see how this, uh, let's say, abandoned zone now lives. And uh, I hope that my dream will come true in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you for the answer. Harumi, uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you for a great presentation. I have a question. In Japan, since the nuclear accident in Fukushima, there has been a debate about whether nuclear power should continue or be stopped. So is there such a debate in Ukraine now? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, can you please repeat debate about what exactly? Uh, uh, in Japan, uh, since the nuclear accident in Fukushima, there has been debate about whether nuclear power should continue or be stopped. Is there such a debate in Ukraine now? Well, thank you for your question. You see, we live in the world which progresses its war forces. Every country has to defend themselves and it's just like a new tool and we cannot fully like just uh, give it uh, up. And I believe that it will still be ongoing despite all of the dangerous um, world and neither of countries is uh, ready to give give it up just just because uh, just because it is actually cruel to humanity as as overall uh, as such. Thank you. Uh, thank you for telling about the introduction. Uh, in Soviet government era, uh, did positive policy about uh, nuclear power uh, industry as like plant and plant and military power as like nuclear weapon. So uh, my question is, uh, in in Ukraine now also, uh, does some people remember as a nuclear power and plant? And not only uh, Chernobyl is Soviet symbol. Uh, if you have known something, please tell me about uh, the question. Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, uh, Ukraine uh, doesn't have any nuclear weapons. Yeah, that's, 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 I'm not I'm very um, aware of politics, actually, but yeah, as far as I know, we don't have any nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Um, and the only occasion that happened, which is uh, quite um, related to um, nuclear things, let's say, uh, it is only that happened in Chernobyl. And uh, we hope that it is the last one. Yes, Ukraine gave up uh, its uh, nuclear, um, I mean, um... Mm, armors, yes, that um, uh, in 2004, if I'm not mistaken, in exchange of for safety, uh, and it was provided by, I believe, Germany, France, and Russia. And uh, in 2014, when Russia actually annexed Crimea, it was when the, uh, in the pact that was established back then um, was actually broken, but uh, uh, the, the, the armors, the nuclear uh, 
nuclear armor was not given back. So for now, it is not clear whether we will have, right now we have a full scale invasion and we are to stop it and get back to, uh, get back our, all of our territories. And after we do so, so I believe that it should be um, discussed internationally, whether we are uh, to get our nuclear armor back. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks again, uh, uh, Vlad and Katja. So maybe uh, we should uh, proceed uh, to the, the last presenter. Uh, Toko, uh, could you please uh, start? Yes, can I share my screen? <clears throat> um, oh. Yes, we see. Uh, Is it is it worked? Yeah, yeah. We see your slide. Okay. Oh, then I'll start my presentation. Um, Dobri Denny students, this is Toko. Um, I'm going to present data about Taras Shevchenko and Kenji Miyazawa. Um, they are they are great poets who represent Ukraine and Japan. Um, uh, yeah, I'm four year student in Saitama University. So um yes, let's start. And firstly, I want to br br briefly introduce Taras Shevchenko for a Japanese student to make a brief review of your presentation. Um first, Taras Shevchenko is one of the greatest poets in Ukraine, and he born in the state of the surf, and he recovered his right by astonishing sense of the earth. But although he he got got free free rights, but he soon it, it won't last um it won't last because he criticized the emperor and I will talk about it later and I can say he spent a free life. So um I re I've read two books of of him and uh, um first copser and three years and uh, i want to share what i what i've been found from his work firstly he described the mother nature in ukraine especially and for example the donipo river and uh, and so on and he mourned his his life and I can I can say some of his works seem negative, and the um how can I say and the the most featured point of his work is he wrote his poet in Ukra Ukrainian so that he can emerge the Ukrainian identity. And I'm going to discuss about his work. Firstly, I said his work uh, contains some negative point, but I think his experience, which he served as a serf, made his made him lament. So he described a lot. Um, he described kind of negative thing, and but he also he wrote a a lot great works, but it. It's not only negative work, but also he showed his bravery and determination and patriotism, which are dedicated to the Ukraine. For example, he criticized, as I said, he criticized Russia Empire and the Emperor in a dream. And he mourned the, the fate of Ukraine in executive mount and my testament. Through those works, he shows sympathy to poor people and severe condition in Ukraine and lament for them. I can say his work contains both sadness and dedication to Ukraine so that they are widely accepted by Ukraine Ukrainians. And uh, he, he wrote in Ukrainian so that he gained the identity, the, he gained, he fostered the ethnic identity in Ukraine. Then I'm going to talk about Kenji Miyazawa, who is Japanese poet. 
He born in Iwate Prefecture, the north part of Japan, which is rich in the nature. At the same time, it's it's kind of um, it will become really severe, especially in winter. And he was a Japanese poet, Japanese poet, novelist, and children's writer. He wrote a lot of works, novels, and poets. And he has a unique and gifted. He he is he was a unique and gifted writer, whose work continues to resonate with readers around the world. Um, I'm going to introduce the features in Kenji's work. He experienced he expressed his philosophy based on Buddhism. Um, for example, in the in his first po poem co collection, which is. A natural in spring, and uh, the idea based is there can be no individual happinesses until the whole world is happy. And he also used a lot of met metaphorical words in his work, and he supported the farmers and workers in his work. So I can say he also. Like Shevchenko, he also showed the sympathy and cheer up workers and farmers in Japan. And he wrote, he says he wrote his poem as the sketch of mine. He tried to wrote his words um, as clear um, in his mind so that he used a lot of metaphorical words. And as I said, he grew up in by surrounded by nature, so he knows how rich the nature in Japan and how severe it is in Japan. So he showed the determination that interact with nature and work for the people. Um, I'm going to introduce his work, his most uh, famous poets called Ameni Momakezu. In English, one gave into the rain. The, the poets start, start with, I will not give into the rain nor to the wind, nor to the driving snow. And it ends with, it may be called, I may be called a fool, but I doubt if anyone will applause, applaud me. Then again, perhaps none will desist, detest me either. All this is my goal, the person I want to become. And I'm go going to read it in Japanese. Hope you enjoy it. Ame ni mo makezu. 宮沢賢治。雨にも負けず、風にも負けず、雪にも夏の暑さにも負けぬ。丈夫な体を持ち、欲はなく決して怒らず、怒らず、いつも静かに笑っている。一日に玄米四合と味噌と少しの野菜を
They both showed the sympathy to the people in severe condition, and they both loved in their, they both showed their love of their motherlands and experienced how beautiful their country were. Here's the references, and Jack, you sorry for the, uh, maybe I couldn't give enough information for you, but um, I'm glad if anyone have comments and questions, and thank you for Oreski to share the beautiful pictures with me. Jack, you. Thank you, Topo. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, we have some minutes, so please, uh, yeah. yeah. Please, uh, Yulia. Yes, thank you, Topo, for such a fascinating presentation. We are deeply like a big pleasure for us that you are interested in our literature, in our Shevchenko, who is like a significant Ukrainian poet and writer. But we also are interested in your literature and your culture because it's full of symbols, full of, of deep meanings. And we learn in school, for example, Kutagawa's Spider's Thread and uh, Haruki Murakami. So uh, what do you exactly like about Shevchenko's work? Like maybe that interested you most? What exactly? Um, can I check if it's, um, you? what you mean is the, the similarity between Shevchenko and Kenji's work? Right. No, just what do you like about Shevchenko's work? Like maybe oh. you, his themes or his ideas. Oh, okay. How about me? And in my opinion, um, I think he, although he experienced a lot suffer in his life, but I said he shows some negative words in his um, poets, but it's not all of his work. And uh, some some of his work, um, like Do Me Moi, Do Me Moi, I don't know if my pronunciation is right or not, but um, it's really, I think it's, it's really impressive to experience Ukrainians' nationality. Is that, um, is it okay for the answer? Thank yes, you for thank the question. You. Uh, please, uh... Please uh, speak, uh, maybe Ukrainian student, please. Yeah, okay, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and thank you for <clears throat> taking interest in Taras Shuchenko and uh, actually telling us about uh, your wonderful artists. So I would like to ask you, uh, what is your favorite work by Shevchenko and work wor what works would you recommend us uh, to read uh, by uh, the poet of yours? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yes, my, my favorite Shevchenko's work is uh do me more do me more and uh testament i think it shows how deeply he loved ukraine and uh mm, and his words is really straightforward so that i love i love them and my recommendation of kenji's work is uh he wrote a lot and sometimes he wrote the some stories and there's a story called uh many older the restaurant which have many orders um the, the story is kind of funny but it contains some ironical meaning so that i want to recommend it to you is it okay thank you so much you're welcome okay uh, Vladislav, yeah please yeah, so I just wanted to make a small comment on your presentation. I just wanted to say thank you for your work and for your presentation. It was wonderful and it was very interesting for me to listen to it because we also, uh, on the first summer, we, together with Karina Sarchenko and Darina Wok, prepared our presentation about Taras Vichenko. So it was really interesting to listen to your perspective. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for the comment. and. I think I should like organize my idea more, but 
I failed to do it, so I want to apologize it. Thank you for the comment. Okay. Alexi, uh, do you have any word? Uh, no questions. Just a big thank you to Tokosan for preparing this presentation. It was uh, very good uh, to listen to it, and I enjoyed working with you. And in the future, if we can work together again, and uh, I can help you, you can help me, it would be great. I will make sure to read the poems of this author that you have presented in today's presentation. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you a lot, Oleski. And if if you uh, if there were not your advice, maybe I couldn't do anything about this presentation. So no, <laughs> thank you that's lot. okay. I'm sure we can help each other in the future. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So maybe I should ask uh, uh, some comments uh, from uh, professors, teachers, uh, Olga Nikolaevna. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nanaka-san. And I would like to say many thanks to all Japanese students and all Ukrainian students for a very great uh, presentation today. Uh, and a special thanks for Toko, for Taras Shevchenko. We feel um, deep support um, of Ukraine through this report. Thank you so much. And I think we will continue uh, to discuss uh, these uh, uh, serious problems uh, uh, of all reports uh, in our next uh, seminar. Uh, I think we will overcome all uh, difficulties and dangerous times. And we uh, dream about uh, the best time for all our countries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lydia Matvievna. Дякую, шановні колеги, за сьогоднішнє засідання. Дякую всім за цікаві доповіді і до наступної нашої зустрічі під час дискусії. Дякую. I would like to thank everyone for their participation and for the wonderful presentations today. And I will be very happy to meet you again next week for our discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I also appreciate uh, your, uh, your today's participation uh, very much uh, because you have had uh, a serious attacks. Uh, I think you showed us the love to the humanities and the courage uh, to study. So please be safe and uh, continue your work. Yeah. So uh, uh, let's uh, meet uh, next week and uh, discuss uh, all the uh, topics uh, which interested you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, see you next time. Have a, uh, have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you.